Hiking is one of those things that kind of doesn't make sense when you think about it. You're walking right in the heart of danger, ready for Bigfoot to come tickle them toes at any moment. Welcome back to the swamp, my friends, and welcome if you're new. Today I'm going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true hiking horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit yours at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp, and stories like yours that help keep this show going on a daily basis. Now, don't forget, slap that like button, subscribe if you're new, and get ready for some allegedly true and downright strange hiking horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. The PCT Can't Be Tamed by Hillary Y. I couldn't believe my luck when I finally set foot on the legendary Pacific Crest Trail. The idea of hiking through the breathtaking wilderness and experiencing the majesty of nature firsthand has always appealed to me. With my backpack securely fastened and a sense of adventure pulsing through my veins, I eagerly embarked on the journey of a lifetime. The first few days were a dream come true. The sun shone brightly overhead casting its warm rays on the rugged terrain. The scenery was awe-inspiring, with towering mountains, lush forest, and crystal lakes. I reveled in the solitude, relishing every step along the winding trail. But as often is the case with the great outdoors, the weather can change in an instant. On the fourth day of my hike, ominous gray clouds gathered above, obscuring the once brilliant blue sky. A chilly wind cut through my layers, causing me to shiver involuntarily. The atmosphere seemed to hold its breath as if anticipating something dreadful. I consulted my map and realized I had several miles before reaching the next campsite. Determined to push forward, I tightened the straps on my backpack and marched on, hoping to find shelter before the storm hit full force. Minutes turned into hours as I pressed on the weather growing increasingly more hostile. The wind howled through the tall pines, bending them at precarious angles. Fat and heavy raindrops began to fall, creating a dissonant symphony as they pelted against the leaves in my rain jacket. Once a well-defined and easy-to-follow trail, it quickly became muddy, making every step a struggle. My boots sank deep into the muck, making progress slow and exhausting. As the light faded, I felt a rising sense of urgency. I needed to find a haven before darkness swallowed me whole. Just when my spirits were at their lowest, I caught sight of a dilapidated cabin, nestled between the trees. Its windows were cracked, and the wooden boards looked weathered and worn. Though, the place seemed abandoned. It offered the promise of a shelter from the raging storm. With renewed hope, I quickly reached the cabin's doorstep, pushing open the creaking door. I stepped into a room frozen in time. The air was thick with the scent of decay and the flickering light of my flashlight cast eerie shadows on the decaying furniture. It was clear that no one had set foot in this place for quite some time, many years if I had to guess. As I explored further, my heart skipped when I discovered a handwritten note on a dusty table. The message, barely legible, spoke of a curse that befell those who sought refuge in this forsaken cabin. It said of a hateful and vengeful entity that roamed the woods preying on lost souls. Goosebumps prickled on my arms, and a chill ran down my spine. Was this a tale to deter trespassers, or was this just some stupid thing kids did, or was there actually something sinister lurking outside? I peered through the broken window, straining beyond the darkness, not seeing much. Suddenly, a bone-chilling wail pierced the air causing me to stumble backward in fear. The sound echoed through the cabin, reverberating in my ears. Panic surged within me as I realized the storm had summoned a creature of nightmares. With every ounce of courage, I gripped my hiking poles and desperately ran for safety. The wind whipped at my face, rain blinding my vision as I sprinted through the treacherous forest. The creature's haunting cries pursuing me. Branches tore at my clothing, my legs burned with exertion. In the distance, I caught a glimmer of light signaling the campsite I had longed to reach. 
With determination, I poured every ounce of every bit of energy I had into getting to that haven. Finally, I burst into the clearing, panting and drenched to the bone. Other hikers gathered around, their faces etched with concern as they saw me dragging myself in my bedraggled state. They offered comfort and warmth, sharing their tents and provisions. As the storm raged on outside, we huddled together, finding solace in each other's presence. Days passed before the storm finally abated, allowing us to continue our journey along the Pacific Crest Trail. The experience forever changed me, though, reminding me of the unforgiving power of nature and the strength of the human spirit. As I recount the harrowing tale of my survival, I urge future hikers to approach the trail with respect and caution, for within its vast beauty lies the potential of unimaginable horrors, waiting to test the limits of your resolve. The Michigan Dogman is Real by Anonymous I had always been drawn to the mystique and allure of the great outdoors, so when the opportunity arose for a day hike in the picturesque forest of Michigan with my friends, I couldn't resist. Little did I know, though, that this adventure would turn into a horrifying encounter with the legendary Michigan Dogman. The day began with clear skies and a gentle breeze rustling through the leaves. I arrived at the trailhead early, excited to embark on my solo hike. Eventually, I would meet up with my friends at the end and we would have a little shindig. The trail meandered through dense forest carpeted with a vibrant tapestry of fallen leaves. As I set off, the scent of pine filled the air and the chorus of birds serenaded my steps. With each passing mile, the wilderness grew thicker around me. The sunlight struggled to penetrate through the dense canopy, casting eerie shadows that danced along the forest floor. Yet an unexplainable sense of unease began to creep over me, as if the very existence, the very essence of the woods were whispering a cautionary tale. Ignoring my mounting trepidation, I pressed forward, determined to conquer my fear. But as the hours wore on, the atmosphere grew increasingly oppressive. The forest silence was deafening broken by the occasional stab of twigs underfoot. Every rustle and hushed whisper of wind seemed to echo with an unseen presence. A peculiar smell invaded my nostrils as I rounded a bend in the trail. It was a potent blend of wet fur and decaying leaves, tinged with a metallic tang. My heart quickened, and a chill ran down my spine. My scent screamed danger, but curiosity compelled me to investigate further. Branches crackled nearby, causing my pulse to race. I turned slowly, scanning the forest with my eyes. And there it stood, bathed in dappled sunlight. A creature unlike anything I had ever seen in my lifetime. Towering on two legs covered in matted fur, it resembled a monstrous hybrid of a man and a beast. The creature's yellow eyes locked with mine, radiating a malevolence that chilled me to the core. Its snout curled with a sinister grin, revealing rows of gleaming, razor-sharp teeth. Fear paralyzed me as the realization dawned. I had come face to face with the infamous Dogman. At the time, it felt like time stood still. I was standing there in some sort of standoff with this thing, like a macabre survival dance, if you will. Every fiber of my being screamed at me to flee and run as far as fast as possible. But I knew deep down that escape was futile. The dogman's predatory gaze left no doubt that I was its prey. Suddenly, with lightning speed, the creature lunged towards me, claws outstretched, its bellowing growl piercing the forest silence. Instinct kicked in and I dodged its initial attack, stumbling backward desperately for my life. But this dogman, this whatever, was relentless, its pursuit fueled by an insatiable hunger for flesh. The chase was relentless. Through tangled underbrush and fallen logs, my heart pounded in my chest, each breath a gasp of terror. Panic set in as the realization dawned on me. I was lost in this nightmarish forest, a pawn in this dogman's sadistic game. Just as exhaustion threatened to consume me, a glimmer of hope emerged. I stumbled upon a dilapidated cabin. Barely standing amidst the wilderness, 
but enough protection to where I could probably figure something out. It was my last chance, a potential sanctuary against the dogman's relentless pursuit. With adrenaline, I threw myself inside, slamming the door shut behind me. The ancient wood creaked under the weight of my desperate refuge, damn near breaking every step I took. I held my breath, praying that the creature would not find me. Hours passed, each minute feeling like an eternity. The sound of the forest faded, replaced by an oppressive silence. The air inside the cabin grew heavy, the smell of damp wood and fear lingering, but there was no sign of the dogman. At least, not for now. As the night wore on, the sky outside grew dark, the moon casting an ethereal glow through the cabin's cracked windows. Fear consumed me, and exhaustion finally took hold. Sleep beckoned, and its embrace, a temporary respite from the horrors that awaited outside, took me. Eventually, I woke up outside, the sun bathed the cabin in a soft golden light. My heart raced as I gathered the courage to venture out. I opened the door with trembling hands, bracing myself for the worst. But there was no trace of the dogman. The forest stood silent and still as if it had swallowed the horrors of the previous day. I stumbled back onto the trail, my body battered and soul scarred. As I returned to civilization, the weight of the encounter settled upon me. The Michigan Dogman was no longer a legend, but a chilling reality etched into the depths of my being. I had survived the encounter, but I knew that the memory of that haunting day would forever haunt my dreams, a constant reminder of the terrors that lurk within the heart of the woods. Always be aware of your surroundings. By Walt J. In the depths of my high school years, I actively participated in the basketball team and track events. To maintain my stamina, I frequented an 11-mile hiking trail that meandered through the ominous hills looming outside my small, seemingly safe town, where everyone knew everyone. Although not entirely secluded, the path possessed an uncanny ambience especially in specific stretches deep into the heart of these foreboding woods. There, the path became treacherously rugged, with patches of dirt and mud tangled with gnarled tree roots that sprawled like malevolent serpents in every direction. The challenge enticed me, forcing me to focus on each precarious step, oblivious to the energy I exerted. For three uneventful years, the trail remained a familiar and secure escape. That is, until the fateful day when literal and figurative darkness descended upon me. Like countless times before, I parked my car on the lonely dirt road, a humble offshoot of the ever-present highway. I indulged in a brief interlude smoking a joint to ease my mind while meticulously selecting a playlist on my phone. With earphones in place and a fresh piece of gum to invigorate my senses, I embarked on the trail. Strangely, I was trying to remember encountering anyone that day. Although it was afternoon, and typical for the course to be sparsely populated compared to the busier evening hours, several minutes passed as I treaded the initial crushed stone path. Once I reached a certain point, the trail transformed into an untamed wilderness. An unsettling change washed over me at this most isolated segment midpoint. Without any discernible reason, an overwhelming sense of dread began to gnaw my insides its icy tendrils squeezing at my core. Nevertheless, I pressed on, attempting to dismiss the foreboding emotions that clung to me like a shadow. As the tail grew steeper, demanding I slow my jog to a cautious walk, I removed my earphones while maintaining a steady pace. In this moment of silence, I became acutely aware of the eerie absence of sound. A haunting stillness enveloped the surroundings, further fueling unease that coursed through my veins. Yet, I remained oblivious to the lurking predator that had infiltrated my sanctuary, its presence unknown to my conscious mind. Although the dense woods that have concealed the potential threats of wild animals such as coyotes or even bears, though unlikely, the inexplicable fear gripping me transcended the realm of natural predators. A peculiar 30-second interlude nestled amidst the labyrinth recesses of my memory, presenting itself as an incomplete nightmare, blurry and indistinct. My recollection centered on a figure concealed within the trees. It was neither animal nor apparition, but unmistakably human. 
a man, a presence if you will. Struggling to visualize the faceless specter, I instinctively averted my gaze, keen on ensuring my obliviousness to its scrutiny. The response was almost involuntary, driven by a primal intuition that lingered deep within my psyche. However, this figure did not trail behind me as I initially thought it would. It stood ahead off to my right at a two o'clock angle. Frozen in place, it remained utterly motionless, silently observing my passage. Though I forged ahead, the tension in the air was palpable. Every nerve in my body screamed for escape. And then, upon rounding a bend approximately 15 feet beyond the figure, I succumbed to an animalistic instinct, an explosion of adrenaline that propelled me forward as if I was possessed. My knees quivered beneath the weight of my sprint, but the fear-driven momentum propelled me faster than I had ever thought possible. Though the haunting whispers of impending footsteps failed to reach my ears, it felt as if they were but a hair's breadth away, eager to seize me, their prey. It was a pure, primal terror that coursed through me defying all rationality. I did not cease my frenzied sprint until the trees relinquished their grip, allowing me to look at the reassuring sight of my car. In the safety of its familiar presence, I finally halted, panting heavily, my body trembling. Despite the adrenaline-fueled chaos that had consumed me, I found no pursuer emerging from the darkness. It seemed as if the evil presence had evaporated, leaving me only with my racing thoughts and the unshakable conviction that someone, or something, had been there lurking amidst the foliage, their intentions far from benevolent. Perhaps they had merely waited for the right moment to pounce, and I inadvertently stumbled upon their evil plot. It may be tempting to dismiss this as a chilling encounter, or maybe some delusions of a stoned teenager wandering the woods alone, yet I had followed that same routine for years engaging in my pre-run rituals, intoxicated or not. No, this was an experience that defied explanation or rationalization, and while I eventually bid farewell to that town, the haunting memory of that day still lingers in my mind, tainting any future attempts to retrace my steps. That peculiar sense of dread remained dormant, ever-present, casting doubt upon the safety of the familiar trails. And at this point, I'm way too scared to go back and traverse it. I wonder if any other people who hike those trails have ever had experiences like this. I never really thought to ask because I didn't want people to think I was crazy. Fred Zalaker, Mount Clark Hiking Incident Fred Zalaker is known for his achievements in running and climbing, including winning races on all seven continents. He has traveled to 137 countries and climbed over 185 mountains. Fred moved from San Francisco to Reno in 1984 and has remained there due to his love for the hills. He is six feet tall, weighing 150 pounds with gray hair and blue eyes. At the time of his disappearance, he was reportedly wearing a yellow shirt and khaki shorts. Fred had gone on a day hike on an off-trail route on Saturday but failed to return as planned. His disappearance was reported on Sunday. Fred was known for his fearless nature and had climbed mountains worldwide, often taking on technical challenges and leading his climbing partners. He was well known in competitive running and mountain climbing circles. Fred's death has led to an outpouring of tributes from those who admired his accomplishments. He set records in his age group, including winning his age group in all six Abbott World Marathon majors and completing marathons on every continent, including Antarctica. He has also summited several famous mountains, including Denali, Kilimanjaro, and Elbrus. Fred's website documented his adventures and showcased his achievements through photographs and lists of countries he had visited. He was described as a very adventurous person who would set and pursue goals with determination. The circumstances surrounding Fred Zalakar's ascent of Mount Clark and his final moments are honestly still under investigation by park authorities, and more details may emerge as the investigation progresses, but it's unlikely. The story is another sad reminder that Mother Nature is unpredictable, and you never know when your last day may be. I indeed extend my sympathies to Fred and his family. If anyone listening to this episode has a case they would like to see covered on the show, please feel free to comment below. Multiple Creatures in the Woods by Connor P. 
Late one night, my buddy and I went back to smoke a bowl. This was back before it was legal in Colorado, so you still had to be kind of sneaky about it. Anyway, we went out into the backyard and sat down. We hadn't even smoked yet, and suddenly we saw the gate leading out to the alley open up and some sort of little creature, like that elf from the movie Harry Potter, met Gollum from the Lord of the Rings, but somehow more realistic if that makes any sense. It had a cloak or some sort of covering on, but I couldn't be sure as when I looked up, it saw us, and as quickly as it had opened the gate, it had almost vanished. It was almost unhuman how quickly it withdrew itself back into the alley and silently shut the gate. Not the most extended encounter, but it shows that there's more than meets the eye out here, even in the big city. This next story happens when I was hiking in the backwoods of Ohio, taking a nature walk if you will. Weed was not legal in Ohio at all. I don't even know if it is now, but you used to have to hike 10 miles out into the bush if you wanted to get away with puffing the old devil's lettuce. Anyway, I had just sparked a, a fat one, and I was enjoying the natural sights and sounds when I heard something back in the woods behind me. I turned around to see what I can only describe as a 15-foot figure swoop from behind one tree to another. I almost shat myself at first, but after just a moment, I thought that maybe, just maybe my eyes were playing tricks on me. Before returning to the creek, I briefly studied where I had seen the thing. I heard this thing again. Almost like a high-pitched, whooping, whistling sound. I turned around and saw a very tall, slender creature practically bouncing from one tree to another, making that high-pitched, whooping sound. I've seen pictures of Sasquatch, which are varying. Some are tall, thin. Some are even, you know, massive in the sense of like being like a bodybuilder. But this one, this one was weird. It was not like a slender man per se, but it was almost like some sort of puppet wearing long, dark, dresses that made it look like it was wavy or something. I don't even know how to even explain it, but I got out of those woods as fast as I could, and I've never even seen anything remotely like that again. But if you're out there in those Ohio backwoods, definitely watch out because there's some strange and creepy things going on out there. Now I know people are going to question 15, 20 feet, you must be exaggerating, but I swear, in the moment, it felt like this thing was towering over me. Appalachian Ghost on the Trail by Willow S. When I was younger, roughly around eight years old or so, I think I saw my first ghost. We were hiking in the Appalachian Mountains, backcountry camping. I was terrified about sleeping in the woods near the top of a mountain, but my mother said we would be fine. Animals are terrified of daddy. My mother said teasingly, holding my mother's hand. I trusted her but was still nervous. We hiked up along the Appalachian Trail until my father decided it was time to settle down and set up camp. We found a nice clearing. The sun was beginning to set. I looked up at my mother to notice she was pale and her hand tightly clasped around mine. T Todd, can we set up somewhere different? My mother asked, still clutching my tiny hand. She wanted to avoid the vibe the woods were giving, and I sensed it too. I was afraid. My father shook his head. Honestly, babe, it's getting late. I'm not searching for firewood in the dark. I remember asking to go home, and the small clearing gave an ominous vibe. After eating some hot dogs and roasting some marshmallows, we crawled into the six-person tent my father had purchased. My father fell asleep in just a few minutes, but my mother and I could not sleep. Emma, are you asleep? I lifted my head. No, Mama, I'm scared. I can't sleep. Hush. It's fine. We're safe inside the tent, she comforted. I finally fell asleep and woke up in the early hours of the morning. I exited the tent and saw my mother meditating on the ground. She meditated every morning with a cup of Earl Grey tea. I came up to her and tapped her on the shoulder. Mama, can we take a walk? My mother opened her eyes and said, Sure, let's not go too far. I don't want Daddy to worry. We were hiking near our campsite when my mother suddenly stopped. I followed her gaze to see a hazy image of a man leaning against a birch tree, roughly 20 feet away from us. He was just a gray image, but he did not seem threatening, just calm and solemn. He lifted his head and looked in our direction. I rubbed my eyes and he dissipated in front of us. My mother just looked at me and I understood that that man was not threatening, just calm and a sad presence. After that, I don't think I've ever seen a ghost again in my life. 
but I will never forget him. The Abandoned Hut by JTFFF Four years ago, I was a sophomore in high school. I had not yet gotten my license, which is right around the time I started to partake in certain substances. And one of my friends in the neighborhood, we'll call him Kurt, knew of a creek about a mile and a half from my house, which would be an excellent smoke spot. But it was a bit of a hike to get there. It was well known that there were a few scattered structures in the woods here, such as a dozen or so concrete huts and old barrel fire pits and platform built in the two trees at some point. I'm not really sure what that's about all within a dozen feet of each other. This is about a quarter mile into the woods and about a half mile from any road. We had been there dozens of times during the daytime, usually with more friends though. We lived in a rather nice suburban neighborhood, so it didn't seem too dangerous to us, not to mention nobody else had ever been spotted there before. It had become a pretty standard smoke spot for kids our age. We all just assumed it was an old abandoned homeless structure but there were still legends passed around by other high schoolers claiming something sinister lurked there. Hooks for hands, serial murderers, inbred cannibals, typical campfire stories, that type of thing. The concrete hut was about seven foot by seven foot by five foot, and the ground had been dug out inside, making the roof even taller. We had found improvised weapons, food cans, trash, etc. when we first discovered it two years prior. But since then, nothing of that nature really popped up. Just beer cans, roaches, and cigarette butts scattered around in the fire pit from neighborhood kids. The inside had scribbled stuff on it with Sharpie. It was covered with a tarp, and the whole thing smelled like pee. So none of us really went inside. As I mentioned, a lookout platform was built into a tree about 50 feet away. An improvised ladder of branches leads to the 5 foot by 5 foot platform about 20 feet off the ground. The wood was water damaged, so it was very hard to get up there. Back on track this particular October evening, Kurt and I left at about 6 p.m. hoping to get there before dark. We had several other smoke spots that were close to my house, but nothing quite matched the excitement and the charisma of the hut. We make our way through the neighborhood, through some backyards into a field, and finally pass through the tree line. Stones laid out across the creek allowed us to cross without getting wet. Right around the time we got there, the sun was almost entirely set, and there was not much light coming through the trees. This was the first time either of us had been there at night. We hiked up the last 500 feet uphill, barely seeing the hut through the darkness. The atmosphere had us both uneasy, and we talked with the quietest whisper possible. We didn't want to approach the structure, so we decided to smoke about 50 feet from the hut, right on the edge of the bluff we had just climbed. I shifted a few feet over to get some more even footing before we started, and I felt my foot snag on a fishing line running about a foot off the ground tied to the tree next to me. A loud clang was made as the line yanked an empty metal bucket into metal scrap planted into the ground. It was a makeshift alarm. We hear someone moving down from the platform in the tree, about 20 feet away from us, and drop into the leaves below. We take off down the bluff, sliding on our asses and hitting trees. We still hear scurrying and grunting behind us. We get to the bottom and sprint through the creek. I trip on the loose rocks below me and fall into the cold water before bolting up and continuing to run. About a second later, we hear splashes behind us. At this point, we clear the tree line and are in a quarter of a mile of an open field. We sprint as fast as we can. Kurt and I are hurt and out of breath, and the person is catching up. We can hear them behind us, breathing heavily and their loud footsteps growing closer and closer. We sprint through someone's backyard and listen to their dogs barking. We finally run into the middle of the street and a car slams on its brakes. Kurt and I screech to a halt to avoid the vehicle. We turn around to see somebody standing just outside of the floodlights of a nearby house before they turn around and run back toward the forest. We apologized to the driver, ditched the weed, and I called my sister to pick us up. We explained what happened, begged her not to tell my parents, and we have never returned to that creek again. Attacked on the local hiking trails by Anonymous this story takes place the summer of 2001 in a small town outside of Rhode Island, where I am from. I am a female, for reference, and I was about 20 years old that summer, in between my junior and senior years of college at the University of Rhode Island. I decided to stay on campus and take some classes so my senior year would be a little lighter and be a bit less stressful for me. 
So I rented out a cute little apartment with a few friends, and we loved it. Like I said, we were in a small town outside of the city. There were a lot of other college students around, and I enjoyed living so close to the beach in the summertime. My schedule was pretty open, so even though I was working and going to school part-time, I had a lot of time to myself and loved the freedom I had to do whatever I wanted. I have always been into fitness and exercise, and one of my favorite things to do that summer was take my rollerblades to the local bike path and listen to music on my earbuds while I glided down the long straight path. Every day, I would drive to the bike path and park my car at the park close by the path and rollerblade the mile-long path until it ended. Another park would begin actually right after this one ended. At that second park, I would sometimes rest on one of the benches and take a little break and drink some water before turning back and going back down that same path again and ending up at the original park where my car was. It's about a two mile go, and I did this about every day. It was fun and great exercise, right up until this incident I'm about to chronicle for you. On this particular morning, I slept in and was running a little bit late, getting ready for my daily workout. I could not find my earbuds anywhere. They were not where I normally left them on my kitchen counter, and after spending some time looking for them around the apartment without any luck, I just said screw it and decided to exercise without them. I get to the park and put my rollerblades on and start my first mile. It was a beautiful July morning and I was enjoying myself when suddenly, unexplainably about halfway through the mile, something felt very wrong. There was just this gut feeling that something was off. The temperature was in the 80s but I had goosebumps all up and down my arms and legs. The hair on the back of my neck was standing up and I had an intense, sinking feeling of dread. I've always had a very strong intuition. I trust it with my life. I felt this feeling before in the past, and it has always served as a warning. But I kept on skating, becoming very aware of my surroundings as I did so. Fight or flight was kicking in, and I didn't even understand why. That was until I saw him. There was a man up ahead on the trail, off the side of the path. The first thing I realized was that he was taking steps backward off the path. He was trying to hide from me in a tree, but I could still see his face from a good distance away watching me, like a dead-eyed predator. He stood there with his hands in his front pockets, not moving at all. As I skated closer to him, the dread in my stomach grew. I noticed he was not wearing workout clothes. He had an oversized hoodie, jeans, and work boots. Nothing you would wear if you were expecting to exercise. Now, I had to quickly make a choice. Do I stop and turn around and go the way I came from, possibly endangering my life by losing the speed and momentum I had gained? Or do I keep skating past him and hope he doesn't rush me from the side, pushing me off the path? The fear I felt turned quickly to rage. Quick backstory on me. I am no stranger to violence and assault from men in my past. I thought... Why should I live my life afraid? Why should I cater to these men who think they can just take what they want from me? Do they think I'm just going to keep taking it? I felt my hands ball up in the fist, my jaw jet out in defiance, and I decided I was standing my ground. Something told me that as I passed him that I needed to remember everything about what he looked like. I noted his dark eyes and beard. I noted his plain blue baseball cap his hoodie, his jeans and construction boots. I could tell you my nostrils were flared and my eyes were flashing anger, and I glared at him with an intensity that said, I see you there, and I'm ready to fight you if need be. We maintained eye contact for what felt like a long time, but could not have been more than just a few seconds. Then he actually broke eye contact, looked away from me, and I knew he had changed his mind at this point about whatever he was considering doing to me, but I was still not safe yet. I flew as fast as I could to the second park and got off the bike path. Now, I was in a tough position. My car was a mile away, as was my shoes and cell phone. I could not go back down that path again and risk passing him a second time. He might have moved, he might have been hiding in a better place waiting for me, knowing I would need to go down that path to get to my car again. So I took off my rollerblades and made my way over to the road that ran parallel to the path and walked the mile back to my car and my socks carrying my skates. It probably looked a bit strange to the drivers that went by, and the walk seemed to take forever, 
Once I saw my car, I ran to it as fast as I could and locked myself in. I never went back there to rollerblade ever again. Unfortunately, the story doesn't just end there, though. After this incident, I went on with the rest of my day. I went to class, I made lunch at my apartment, I got ready for work, and went to my closing shift where I work as a waitress. I returned to my apartment complex at around 10pm to find my neighbor yelling excitedly on his cell phone in the parking lot, pacing and smoking a cigarette as he talked. He and his girlfriend lived upstairs from me. I didn't know them well, but they were friendly enough. She studied nursing and he was a business major. We had all hung out shortly after move-in day, drinking beers and smoking joints on their balcony, and I thought they were both pretty nice people. I parked my car and started walking towards the building just as he was hanging up from his cell phone. I nodded politely towards him and he offered a friendly greeting, something like, Hey, how's it going? Seeing his face closer now under the lights, I could tell he had been crying. He told me his girlfriend was in the hospital. She had been attacked and violated by a strange man, and was recovering from some various injuries. Most seriously, a head injury from smacking her head on the concrete. As he described to me what happened, I felt tears rising in my own eyes and it felt like I had been punched in the stomach. What I said to him next made his jaw drop. I said, Did that happen on the bike path? He incredulously said yes, and demanded to know how I knew that. I told him I knew who did it, and I explained what happened to me that morning. He immediately asked if I could talk to the police and give a description of the man. Because of the little voice in my head that told me I needed to remember everything about his appearance, I was able to give a full detailed description of this man to the police. For months after this incident, I checked the news to see if he was ever caught, but I never heard that he was. The girl he attacked did make a full recovery, and shortly after returning from the hospital, she and her parents showed up in a moving van and packed up all her things in her apartment. I never saw her again. For a long time after that, I felt a lot of guilt about what happened to her. I felt that somehow her fate was meant for me, but I skirted it and left it for someone else to suffer through. What did I do to ward off this attack? What did I do that she didn't? The last and most chilling piece of this story, though... The earbuds that I lost the morning of this incident, the ones I looked all over my apartment for and that I had decided to forego using that day because I didn't have the time to look, I found them the next day on the kitchen counter, exactly where they were supposed to be. I know for a fact they weren't there when I looked, and I cannot explain why they disappeared that morning. I know my roommate didn't take them. I can only suppose that my awareness of the situation was the thing that saved me in the end, and some higher power was looking out for me that day. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true hiking horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. If you enjoyed these stories, be sure to slap that like button as it helps me out a ton. The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube promotes it and that helps the swamp grow its ever-expanding waters. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. You can also submit them on reddit at r slash the dark swamp. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp It's stories like yours that help keep us going on a daily basis. If you're new here to the swamp be sure to turn on notifications and subscribe to not miss a new video as I upload them multiple times a week on all things natural and supernatural. If you're on the go but don't have YouTube premium but still want to download and listen to your favorite swamp dweller scary stories no matter where you are. You can download them absolutely free from Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Google Podcasts, and pretty much everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. It's free and always will be. Thank you so much for supporting The Swamp the way you guys do. I couldn't do this without your guys' support. Don't forget to jump on over. Let me know in the comments what story was your favorite tonight. Comment the code word code red to confuse anybody who didn't make it to the end. The funniest comment will be pinned at the top as always. Thank you guys, and I'll see you soon with another creepy episode.